the program goes on. Um, but let's get started. We've got, a, we've got a great one for you tonight. So good evening and thank you for joining the Crystal Lake Public Library tonight for our Horror in Hollywood lecture presented by Professor of Motion Picture and Television Studies at College of DuPage, Tony Venezia. He's bringing nearly 25 years of film and television experience and expertise to the, our program tonight. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to ask questions that pertain to the content of the presentation and we'll address them at the conclusion. If you're having any technical issues, um, put those in the chat feature and I will try to assist you from there while the presentation is going so that we don't have to stop and um, interrupt the flow of the presentation. So tonight's program will also be recorded and hopefully available on the Crystal Lake Public Library YouTube channel shortly. So without further ado, I'm gonna close out my window and turn it over to our guest for some ha Halloween fun with horror in Hollywood. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. And um, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this is this is quite a treat for me. One of one of the most important parts of film in my life has been monster movies. I, I don't know why, but it just happened that way. But uh, when I was a kid, um, grade school, and my older brother had this weird scrapbook of, of, of the, the TV series he used to watch. And I, I was fascinated by it. Could I, I never could watch the movies because um, I was too little and they were too hor you know, like they're not really that horrifying now, but they were at the time for a little kid. So as I got older, I got to see most of these movies and um, they've had a big impact on my career. So the first uh, first part of my career, I was working in commercially uh, in special effects and animation in Hollywood. And um, I got into teaching while I was doing that. I taught part time and then I, I was hired at COD in 2005. And I don't really get to talk about monster movies that much, uh, although now is, now is my big opportunity. So I, I'd just like to start out with uh, my introduction. I will play that movie right now and then um, and we can talk a little bit and I'll get on to the next the next uh, topic shortly. One little hit up here, but I'll get it, I'll get it fixed. Nope, it's all good. monster from his slab began to rise and suddenly to my surprise he did the mash he did the monster mash the monster mash it was a graveyard smash he did the mash it caught on in a flash he did the mash he did the monster mash from my laboratory in the castle east to the master bedroom where the vampires feast the ghouls all came from their humble abode to get a jolt from my electro that's just an excerpt of uh, I used I kind of pirated something for myself so that that's the intro to a, um, an animation I'm working on um, but I thought it was a good lead into what we're talking about tonight. The song is a 1962 song by Bobby Boris Pickett and uh, called The Monster Mash. And I think it's pretty familiar. I, I Well, I grew up during that time, so it was familiar to me. But I, when I play it for other people, they seem, you know, younger people, too, seem to have heard the song before. Um, one thing you may not know is that the voice uh, is... Um, uh, 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 Boris Pickett is actually a um, an imitation of Boris Karloff, who 
he's he played the original Frankenstein's monster that he just grumbled in that film, but he did other films where he actually talked. So that was kind of drawing off of some historical uh, aspects of, of uh, monster movies. Uh, the next film I'd like to show or group of, um, well, actually, let me finish my introduction here first. So um, horror and film is a genre that is intended to produce fear in its audience for the sake of entertainment. Some of the cinematic techniques used in these films are intended to evoke psychological reactions in an audience. And despite, despite the uh, social controversy at times due to their subject matter, some horror films and franchises have experienced commercial success influenced society and resulted in several popular cultural icons. And these are the sorts of things we'll be talking about tonight. So I want to lay down a little history. And the first, uh, the first group of uh, clips I'm showing tonight go back to, uh, they range from 1896 into 1907. So just, I'm just picking three films. Uh, one is um, unnamed, it's called uh, Early Superimpositions. And this was just a, okay, film and um, as we know it started in 19, 1894. So two years later, filmmakers were experimenting, pushing the, the art of film to see what you could do with film that you couldn't do with, um, you know, like in live action. So this, uh, the first clip is uh, entitled Early Superimpositions and it involves some very early special effects. The next clip is an excerpt of a film called The Haunted Castle uh, created by George Milliers. Milliers was a, a key figure in early sound and especially in special effects. His best films were done in the, probably the first three years of the, at the turn of the century. But nonetheless, he took his magician's background and put it into films. So in 1896, to do what he's doing in this film was absolutely remarkable. The next film in that series is called The Haunted Hotel by J. Stuart Blackton. Uh, he was a, an animation pioneer and then, then uh, gave up animation and just went into producing and directing uh, live action films later. But this um, this clip is uh, uses stop motion animation in a very unique way too, to bring uh, life to a bunch of inanimate objects in a hotel that was supposed to be haunted. So. I will go to my next clip. I need one second to pull it up.
Okay, so I uh, the early films are really inspirational to me. I mean, if you think of it, in 1896, no one had ever seen a skeleton dancing on a ship. Never, ever in the history. And that was the first. Um, the Ahari Hotel is uh, another really fascinating film. And you kind of start, I start playing with my imagination. Like I would like to stay in that hotel. But then the other thing that I find really interesting and also inspirational about these films is at the time, these were, these were pioneering projects. And you can look at today in the state of the art of film animation um, and live action. And uh, we're, <clears throat> You know, it's very sophisticated in a lot of ways, but there's still new things. Things one uh, one thing can lead, an idea can lead you someplace else if you let it happen. So that's what these filmmakers were doing. They they were just playing around with ideas, experimenting, and these great things happened. So the next clip is an excerpt of the first film version of the movie Frankenstein in 1910. Um, I I think this is a little known fact, maybe. Maybe uh, you know this, but um, Thomas Edison was really, really big in film. And he produced a lot of silent movies in the early 1900s. This was one of his films um, that was thought to be lost. So I remember when I was a kid, I was dying to see this film. And the only thing I could ever see is uh, there was a picture of the monster. And at the time they thought that was, the, that was it. There was nothing left of this film but this one little picture. Um, film in those days was the film stock disintegrated over time. It didn't last all that long. And if it was stored properly, it would last longer. So there was some hidden place in the planet of uh, uh, one existing print of Frankenstein that was re restored in 2015. Uh, this is an excerpt of that movie. And let me load it up and we'll take a look at it.
So there were some interesting tricks in that film. The, the part where the monster is forming was shot um, with, uh, the footage was run backwards. If you look at it closely, you can see the smoke dropping down. Um, so they had the, the monster fairly well constructed and they br it burned it and over a period of time, it kind of melted. And then the film was, when it was printed, went the opposite direction. So it looked like it was forming into something. Uh, that, that would become a fairly common, actually that kind of stuff is still used today, but um, I'm gonna move on to the next film. And this is, uh, we're gonna get into vampires in a second. So this is, a uh, film that I'm working on, and it's a tribute to some of these classic movies like the uh, Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman. Um, this is mostly featuring Dracula. Uh, or No, he's not Dracula. This is just a vampire. But anyway, we'll take a look at this. You have, learned, you have learned it will be well for you to return to your own country. You will remember nothing I now say. I hope you haven't taken my stories too seriously. And now I will leave you.
keep forgetting to unmute. Uh, if anybody has any questions on that project, uh, we can talk about it during the Q&A session. So now, now let's get into Hollywood vampires. Well, actually, the first one is from Germany, not Hollywood. But um, this is a film called Nosferatu, made in 1922. It's the last silent film I'm showing today. It's by F.W. Murnau. Um, and it is a, a quite, it's considered a very significant film in history. And if you're re really into this kind of stuff, I highly recommend watching the movie. So I, I'm just going to quote uh, the first um, the first part of a poem by Lord Byron in 1819. And it, it, the topic was vampires. But first on earth as vampires sent, thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent. Then ghostly haunt thy native place and suck the blood of all thy race. So that's what a vampire is all about. So we're moving uh, forward into what uh, just a history of the, a little bit of a history of vampires. Um, the idea of the dead returning to feed off the living grew in the 12th century Europe. Um, an English historian William of Newburgh described instances of the dead coming back to attack people in the night. We call these creatures bloodsuckers. These were actual accounts that the people believed were, were absolutely true. This isn't fiction. So the only way you could kill these uh, these creatures was by burning their bodies. Similar stories swept across Europe uh, from the 16th to 18th centuries, and people were convinced these beings were real. And um, the sa at the same time, interesting enough, uh, werewolves became prevalent. So think about you know the, the origins of the werewolves um, and the rise of vampires happened happened in the 16th to 18th centuries and. People would tell stories and write books about them um, before, long before movies came along. So the, uh, I'm going to show clips of Nosferatu, like I mentioned. Uh, this is an unauthorized version of Bram Stoker's book, Dracula. There's a lot of similarities between this, uh, this version of Dracula and the actual film, uh, 1931 version. I'm going to show some clips in a few minutes of that. Uh, the era that this was made, um, early 20s, uh, was during a time where Germany was being forced to make war um, You know, Germany was being faced to make war reparations. So the company was practically in a depression. Um, the uh, uh, Germany withdrew into seclusion. The government prohibited importing of foreign films. And as a result, German audiences had no films to watch. So um, there then there was a demand for film, so the German government came to that realization, and then they started funding film production. So uh, that was where Germans, Germany started their own uh, movement of expressionist uh, expressionist art. Well, it came actually as a result of of the the horrible things that were happening to them after the war. Now, on a side note. Later, uh, Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister, minister uh, came to recognize how powerful a tool the cinema was for spreading propaganda. It was used throughout the Hitler's rise to power. And I suppose you might conclude that some of the German films from this era unintentionally aided Hitler in his rise to power. So what is horror about? I mean, um, what is it about monster? This is a question asked by research scientist Coltrane Shrivner. Uh, what is it about monsters, murderers, and the macabre that draws us in and inspires our curiosity? What does this morbid wait, let me take two? What does this morbid curiosity say about us? How is it related to our personality and well-being? Horror can provide this sense of control by shifting the source of your anxiety. Once a fictional world of horror has your attention and you escape into the narrative, the source of your anxiety changes. Instead of feeling anxious about a social interaction that went awry, looming deadlines, or any other number of anxiety-inducing events in the real world, your, anxi your anxiety is now attached to the monster on the screen. Importantly, you are now choosing to feel anxious rather than anxious being anxiety being something that just happens to you outside of your control.
Okay, let me show an excerpt of Nosferatu. Okay, so we're going to get into a little bit more about, wait, let's see, oh, I did unmute, I'm sorry, I thought I forgot to unmute, but I, never mind. Um, all right, so let's talk more about vampires. I'd like to get into sound films now. The um, Bram Stoker's novel Dracula is not only a horror story, but it's a commentary on Victorian England as it presents conflicts between old traditions and new ways. And I've learned about this a few years ago, but I had never heard that before. And it was really interesting. I just thought it was always a story like a you know horror story about a vampire. Um, so there is a social commentary being made by the, the, the book on top of that. Uh, so I'm going to show a clip from a movie called Vampire, and it's tied together with uh, the original movie Dracula uh, that was done in sound. Uh, Vampire was directed by uh, Carl Dreyer, 
in um, in um, in uh, it was released in uh, 1932. Uh, Dreyer was required to make this film in three languages, and as a result, there is very little dialogue. Instead of dialogue, he used title cards, as they would do in silent movies. And that was sort of um, an outmoded thing. Uh, silent movies had gone away pretty much after 1927. Um, when this film, Vampire, had its initial release, it received a very negative reception from audiences and critics. Uh, however, contemporary critics' responses are much more favorable with critic and with the critics praising the film's disorienting visual effects and overall feel. Uh, the next film, I, I've got these out of order on purpose. I wanted to save Dracula, the 1931, for the second movie in this uh, this this next segment. Um, as famous a character as Lugosi's portrayal of Dracula is during his 50-year acting career, Lugosi played a vampire on only four films, and, and two times he was Count Dracula. One in the movie we're about to, uh, well, actually, we're going to see clips from both films that he was Dracula in, but Dracula, uh, 1931, and then um, in 1948, he was Dracula and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Um, the other two films were The Mark of the Vampire, made in 1935 and Return of the Vampire in 43. He was uh, given a different name in both of those films uh, due to copyright issues and they didn't want to bother clearing his name so he could be Dracula. Um, this was really interesting. So I showed you a clip of my film uh, that I'm working on. And um, it's um, initially, I, I wanted to start out with Dracula's, uh, Bela Lugosi's voice in the film. So I, I, I got a copy, I digitized a copy of the movie and I cut it down where I isolated all of Bela Lugosi's dialogue. He talks less than six minutes in a feature film, start to finish. And the what I find absolutely fascinating by that is, first of all, if you watch the movie, it doesn't seem like that's all he talks. But his six minute appearance in that film started uh, this, um, created this iconic vampire that can, this is still seen in numerous movies today, TV shows, commercials, some of the films, uh, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, uh, The Simpsons, uh, commercial for General Mills, Audi, Audi and um, many others, as well as Sesame Street. And I'll show you a clip of, of a regular character on Sesame Street who is a model of the Bela Lugosi vampire. So let's take a look at these clips now.
I am Dracula. Oh, it's... It's really good to see you. I bid you welcome. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. The spider spinning his web for the unwary fly. The blood is the light, Mr. Renfield. I trust you have kept your coming here a secret. I followed your instructions implicitly. Excellent, Mr. Renfield. Excellent. I hope you will find this comfortable. Thanks. It looks very inviting. Ouch. Oh, it's nothing serious. Just a small cut from that paper clip. Just a scratch. This is very old wine. I hope you will like it. Aren't you drinking? I never drink. Why? That last line Bella Lugosi read is very famous. And um, I never drink wine. It's like if you look on YouTube and search it up, it, it comes up in all kinds of different, uh, different contexts. A couple of things I wanted to say a little bit more on Bela Lugosi, then we'll move on to Frankenstein. Um, he was born in Hungary, and his, uh, in air quotes, Transylvanian accent is actually Hungarian. Trans although Trans Transylvania is a region in, um, in Romania, which borders Hungary, so there's probably some similarities in the, the dialect. But um, anyway, um, he uh, was... Um, has really, uh, per, wait. I think that was the only thing I wanted to say about that. Now, oh, I know one last little detail about this film was um, submitted or um, accepted for preservation in the National Film Registry as culturally, historically, and uh, aesthetically significant. Okay, so we're going to move on to Frankenstein next. So there's, I'm going to show three versions of, of um, different um, renditions of Frankenstein. The first one is the first sound version um, that was uh, directed by James Whale in 1935. And this is considered, another film considered um, culturally, culturally significant and was also uh, accepted into the National Film Registry in 1991. Uh, the character, the monster of Frankenstein, is, is very recognizable in all kinds of things, similar to Dracula. So, so he's basically become an icon or stereotype of what Frankenstein's monster looks like. Um, I, I chose some clips from The Bride of Frankenstein because there's a commercial that I'm showing later that they use some of the same clips. And then um, I... I was looking, I was going to be short on time. I, I wanted, really wanted to include the Wolfman 
in this uh, talk. So the last clip is from Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and it's a scene where the monster, uh, the Wolfman, and Dracula all meet in the same place. Quite a good scene, isn't it? One man crazy, three very sane spectators. down. Sit down. I'm Maria. Will you play with me? Come home, Hans. The monster is dead now. Nothing could be left alive in that furnace. Why do you stay here? I want to see with my own eyes. Oh, Hans, he must be dead. And dead or alive, nothing can bring our little Maria back to us. I can see his blackened bones. I can sleep at night. Come back, Hans! You will be burned yourself. Maria drowned to death and you burned up. What should I do then?
friend. This last film is um, yeah, but I'm kind of still on me. Frankenstein is a fun movie. I, I want to say one more thing about the original Frankenstein or the original sound Frankenstein, which was the first in these clips. The scene with the little girl and the monster, where she wanted to, she introduced herself as Maria and she wanted to, him to play with her. Um, I I cut that about where it was cut in the original version of the film. It, it was actually censored. So if you watch Frankenstein now, I'm not going to do a spoiler. But there's more, a lot more to that scene, and maybe use your imagination what happens. But it was cut out by the censors. And another really interesting thing with the film at, at the beginning, there's a, a verbal disclaimer. A, a, a speaker gets up and talks about how horrific the movie is, and kind of entices people to watch it. So it's a very interesting intro. All right, the next part of my talk is actually going to be more watching than talking. Um, I've got about 10 minutes of commercials that um, they're very interesting um, that use monsters and the kind of monsters we've been talking about tonight. Um, so let me. So when you watch these, pay attention for any, any of the different types of uh, creatures you see, stereotypes. And there's a couple, two or three commercials in here. If you didn't know they were commercials, you'd actually think they're horror movies. Then there's other ones that are just, they're more for fun. So it's a good variety, it's a good mix, and let's take a look at them. Volkswagen, maybe you should look into our big car, the Volkswagen 411. It has some things no Volkswagen ever had, like four big doors and lots of room and luxury for the whole family. It has some advanced things most cars don't have, 
like electronic fuel injection, an automatic preheating system, and a big trunk up front. But you don't have to be a genius to drive the 411 because it comes with an automatic transmission, also a standard equipment. So now, there's a Volkswagen big enough for just about everyone. The Volkswagen 411 four-door sedan. Don't be scared. I'm the super sweet monster with the super sweet new cereal, Count Chocula. Biffle, here's the super sweet new cereal, Frankenberry. But I've got chocolate sweeties for monstrous chocolate flavor. Well, I've got berry flavored sweeties for monstrous strawberry flavor. Count Chocula. Frankenberry. Hi. Ah. <laughs> Frankenberry. Count Chocula. Why, it's uncalculating. Isn't it dark in there? Not for my new Anylite Solar Calculator from Texas Instruments. You have a Texas Instrument? Texas! Texas Instruments Anylite Calculator. Unlike other solar calculators, it works in almost... Anylite. Good and feel. The new line of Anylite Solar Calculators from Texas Instruments. Imagine the Prince of Darkness with a solar calculator. of judders. But schnapps, though sweet, has teeth, my love, and sharpened ones at that. Beware the judder man, my dear, when the moon is fat.
Oh dear, the Samsung Taco Icon is only $59.95 on pay as you go. Phones for you, missing our tails will warn you. Behind the chainsaws. Smart. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you're in a horror movie, you make poor decisions. That's what you do. Shh, I'm being quiet. Breathing on me. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to Geico. It's what you do. So do you guys think being fast is better than being slow? Yes! It's better to be fast, to not be bitten by a werewolf, and then you'll be turned into one, and you'll have to stay in, and then you'll have to get shaved because you'll be too hot, and then you're like... Which means I wish I was back to a human. What? It's not complicated. Faster is better. And AT&T is the nation's fastest 4G LTE network for your iPhone 5. All right, I wanted to include that last commercial. It, it wasn't really a horror movie, but that little girl was too great to not show her tonight. All right, now we're getting close to the end. I have a couple more clips I'd like to show. Um, and the next one is a compilation of, well, I said contemporary films, but they go back about 50 years. Just clips from about um, eight or nine different feature films and a couple TV shows. So let me pull that up and take a look at that. What's the matter? Grant, give him the... What? 
It's the boogeyman. As a matter of fact, it was. I met him 15 years ago. I was told there was nothing left. No reason, no conscience, no understanding. Life or death. <laughs> Can I get your ghost, Bob? Times do you want me to count zero? None! That's zero more times! Oscar wants to hear me count zero! <laughs> Sorry, my dad insisted on coming. Dad, I don't need a chaperone. I'm 400 years old. You live in my crypt. You play by my rules. You're tearing me apart! Dinner is served. Excuse me, have you seen these kids? I did, and they were sneaking kisses. One kiss. Ah, ah, ah. Two kisses. Ah, ah, ah. Three kisses. There they are. They're coming back. Give it what it wants. Won't be long now. You're gonna get what you deserve. What big eyes you have.
My last call was four hours ago. If you want some coffee, you can put some on her. Run! Run! It is every hunter for themselves. Good luck. I'll be rotting for you. But one of you is a monster. Masquerading as one of our own. I can't wait to find out what breed of evil you are. Please don't do this. Death is coming for you! Werewolf by Night. Okay, I'm going to have uh, one more little clip to show, but uh, and then we can go to uh, to Q and A time. But I wanted to talk uh, about uh, this is a quote from uh, Malcolm Turvey. Uh, he's a film studies professor at Tufts University, and his his comments on horror. So horror is a genre that people tend to look down upon and not take very seriously. It has a reputation of being a low, somewhat trashy, titillating genre that appeals to our basest instincts. But it's wonderful. It's a wonderful popular art form through which very complex ideas and creative techniques can manifest themselves. And if you can get past the very cliche view, you realize there is an embarrassment of riches in this genre. So on that note, I'm going to show the last clip of the evening. Uh, this is a this was produced by a uh, a group of students, a student project in um, the Toon Boom Harmony class at College of DuPage. It was just created um, a couple of days ago. So anyway, let me show that and then we can go to Q&A time.
Oh, I'm sorry. I was muted. Um, the um, the clip I tried to show you didn't have any sound on it, so I just dug up another version so I can show you this. Um, I'll be right back. That's a great cup of coffee. This has been Monsters in the Office. I am so tired of this freaking project. It just... Mm, uh, mm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh no, I missed another deadline. Hey Bess, I got you a coffee. Yeah, yeah, whatever, just leave it over there. Okay. Well, those are all the movies I have to show, and um, I guess now it's Q&A time. All right. If anybody has questions, um, please put them into the Q&A. Um, I will kind of start to give you guys a little bit of time to go. What would you, just on a personal level, what is your favorite monster movie? Oh, that's a tough one, but I think I really think the original Frankenstein. I go and there's some really there's some really good contemporary films, or or more current films too that I think would be uh, you know really notable. There's films that I didn't show um, that are uh, I would recommend uh, like Alien. I, I like that film too, and that that's also like on the top twenty list of. Uh, um, scary films there's some new ones i kind of like these because my daughter and i have a common uh she likes watching monster movies too so like the conjuring and, and um uh let's, let's see paranormal paranormal activity those are fun but favorite it goes back to the earlier films like you know like i said frankenstein the bride of frankenstein uh dracula Awesome. Uh, we have a question from Shannon who wants to know what are good formulas for a horror movie and how do you think they will evolve? 
That's a two. That's a two seater. <laughs> well, uh, horror movies. Okay, so you're dealing with the unknown. There's got to be some sense of that, or else there's no horror to it. So, if you look at some movies, like I, I really like Halloween, John Carpenter's film that came out in nineteen. Uh, I think it was seventy eight. No, it was 82, I believe. Anyway, that was the first of the Halloween series. But there's some really frustrating moments in there where somebody goes into a house and it's pitch black and they know something's wrong and there's some evil in there. And there's a light switch on the wall. So turn on the light switch. You know, they don't do that. So those sorts of things, that detracts from a film when I see stuff like that. So you have to be clever enough to have that unknown uh, and create the uh, sense of like a supernatural or there's a presence there that nobody knows where it is. Um, there, so, you know, if you can see these films, if you, know, you get in the right mindset and just watch some of these older films and then look at newer ones, they're just as scary in a lot of ways too. So really um, there's some elements that don't change sort of to build that sense of horror. I think also uh, films can really, um, you know, coming out of COVID, there was a lot of horror, horror films made in the last few years. And I think COVID was a very traumatic time for just about everybody on our planet. So to some level or another that, you know, if you buy into the philosophy that I mentioned earlier, that horror films are like a good escape because you know, basically, you know, you're safe, but you can still have all that feeling. And it gets you, you can have those horrible feelings like fear is all around you, but you know that's not gonna last after the movie's over. And you have a you can get a break from real life. Um, but again, I think those are common elements too. So, yeah, you know, so I, I guess I'm not answering your question with a <laughs> conclusive black and white answer. If- um, Well, the unknown is very uh, terrifying. So without conclusions, it's, you know. So I, I just it's presented a horrific- <laughs> All right. Um, Michael says, I love your presentation. I'm a sucker for the universal monsters. This is more of a compliment than a question. No, um, we have one that says, how exactly did going to a hotel inspire your horror writing besides watching shorts? You mean the haunted hotel? Um, or <laughs> I guess. Uh, well, I don't know because films like that play in my imagination. I love animation, and that was my career has been based around animation, both in, in my professional career and in my teaching. And I, you can do anything in animation, create anything, create any, you know, like create your own environment, your own worlds, your own actions, make make the rules that exist in the project your own. So something like the haunted hotel. I don't think it's a very scary film. It's more of a humorous film, but you know, taking those elements. So I was thinking of a hotel uh, my wife and I stayed at uh, this past summer for a night, and it was supposed to be haunted. I was I was hoping to to see some you know fruition of that, we, which we really didn't. But just thinking about it was kind of scary. And if I I wouldn't have been surprised if our lamp started flying across the room or <laughs> something like that. Um, I think that would have been a little freaky when it's a real life, but um, I don't know. I feel there, there um, kind of makes me think about what you can actually do with film too. You know, like it, it's free imagination. Uh, what has somebody done? I, you know, like it's hard to come up with brand new ideas, but it's not hard to come up with a variation of somebody else's idea. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where creativity can really, you know, really thrive. And, if you're into horror movies and you want to write stories or make films yourself, think about those sorts of things. What scares you? And then kind of break it down. What is it specifically that attracts you to a certain type of a horror movie or a certain scene in a horror movie? All right. Um, we have, did you do your own opera singing in the COD short? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was me. All right. Uh, <laughs> No, but I'm um, I, I'm I'm a fan of opera, and I was just I, I was working on that. Okay, so this is for the movie I showed an excerpt of earlier today, uh, at the towards the beginning, and the werewolf is uh, going to be in chapter three. 
because I was just modeling and I was building a character and getting them moving. And um, they, uh, I was listening to the Barber of Seville and I was like, oh, this is hysterical. I wanted, so I, and I was working, um, I've been taking this class uh, at COD over and over again. It's in my program and I actually proposed the class, but it, it's um, training in Toon Boom Harmony, which is a 2D animation software. And now I'm just, it's keeping me working on the film. So I, even though, you know, I've taken the same class three times, I'm doing new things with it. So I felt like, um, uh, the the assignment was to do talking. It's like okay, let's you know I'm, I'm gonna make this guy sing instead of talk. So um, the the words the this part of the opera, this character is singing about all these great barber tools they have, all that state of the art, you know what are, you know for cutting hair and you know different kind of gel, not gels, but you know tonics they use in their hair and stuff. Okay, awesome. Um, we have another one from your biggest fan, by the way. Um, this, or what is the best horror movie you've seen um, from the 21st century? Okay, um, I have to think about that. I, I, there haven't been any like super amazing films, but I, I really think the, uh, like the Conjuring, was really good. I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and, um, the uh, uh, paranormal activity was a fun thing. Uh, there's some I haven't really. I like. I, I'd like to see some of the other ones, like um, the uh, uh, Insidious. I haven't watched yet, and uh, a couple other ones. Scream. I've not actually. I've not watched that either. So that's uh, that. Wait, let me make sure. No, that doesn't count. That's 1997. So, but anyway, you know, there's, there's, I, I need to do a little catching up in the more contemporary ones. Okay. Uh, someone's asked, do you remember I was a teenage werewolf with Michael Landon from the late 50s? Yes. In fact, I was, if I were going to go into the werewolf, I had, if, you know, like this is a kind of presentation I could do over, a, you know, like I, several times if I were teaching this in class. I would probably make this, um, you know, break it up into two or three sections. So I didn't get into werewolves other than uh, Frankenstein meets um, um, Fre or Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. But w if I were going to do anything with werewolves, I wanted to have that, you know, some of Michael Landon and the, the movie that we were just asking about. All right. What are your thoughts on the newer version of Halloween compared to the original, such as the Rob Zombie remakes or the one that just came out recently? Um, I'm going to watch the one that just came out. They're just advertising it right now. Um, the other one, I was very disappointed with everyone but the first one, because I really feel like that was that was the, I don't know, that, that was the best. And the remakes just were like, so, in, in my opinion, weren't that exciting, and so I and I haven't seen the latest one, the one that's called the End, but that's um, yeah, I, that's on my to do list. I'll probably watch it in the next week or so. All right, uh, Michael says, "Great job, Tony. What did Millais do technically to transition new characters into his scenes? For example, a puff of smoke, and a new character is in the scene. So, what kind of like?" camera trickery, stage combination, stage magicianship? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question. So in uh, 1896, in fact, when he made his films after 1900 too, the same, same thing existed, but there weren't any ways to composite film. And then what that means is you can't shoot two or three elements and marry them, put them all together in one piece of film. So what he would do, um, the, the actors were trained. He'd roll the camera and stop the camera. Everybody had to remain motionless. And if somebody uh, then, like he'd throw in, if there was a puff of smoke, he would uh, throw in the, the, the bomb that would make the smoke, roll the camera, have that smoke go off. But uh, at the same time, he removed the character. So it, it was just a bunch of jump cuts. So if you do, you could try this. Um, Run, um, run a camera, stop it, change something. You know, just maybe you could do it with still objects, so you could have things disappearing and appearing. And um, he 
wasn't able to do transitions like smooth transitions. So he came, that's why he came up with the smoke and uh, some other, you know, kinds of uh, methods of deceptions and the film would then begin rolling again. So, oh. no, go ahead. Is no, and then um, in, in the next films, he did um, multiple exposures with the same piece of film. So he'd, he'd block off part of the film so it wasn't exposed and he exposed part of it. And then he would have a, a mask that would he'd rewind the film and he'd block off the part that was exposed and expose the part that wasn't exposed. And sometimes he would do that eight or nine times. But that came a little later, but not that much later. Like a trip to the moon had all kinds of stuff like that in it. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your advice for aspiring horror filmmakers? Keep doing it, uh, whatever. Uh, I, I'd say watch as many of the films as you can. And okay, so you got to get when you're, oh, this is my perception. I'm not saying all filmmakers should do this, but uh, I analyze stuff quite a bit. And if I see something I really like, um, if I want to do it in a film I'm making, then I do an analysis. I break it down and really think about not only technical, but psychological. What is it? What do I connect with? And then understand um, if I'm doing something, I, I'm, who am I talking to? Who's my audience? And what do I want my audience to walk away feeling? And then writing, writing for that and actually creating it. I really like to put myself into the role of the character. So if I'm like the that werewolf singer, I was I was um, I'm not done with that with that character yet. That I think I'm done with that animation, but I'm not done with the character. So when I do the final of that, I I am going to be the werewolf, and I won't go around my house scaring my you know <laughs> my wife or anything. But but you know like when I'm doing the animation, then I become the characters I'm animating. A lot of it, and that's that's how you get the life your life into a, a, a subject. So you really have to know who they are. So understanding, if you have a horror film, understanding the theme you're going for, big picture, what do you want people to walk away with? And then when you start doing scene breakdowns, what is what are the characters like? What are the character flaws or the strengths of each character? And know them intimately, like almost like they're you. And then how do, how do you put all that together to bring it out in the story? Awesome. All right. Um, Jose would like to know, have you seen Stranger Things? If so, do you feel like classic monsters have inspired this series? I've seen the first two seasons of Stranger Things, and I believe they have. So I, I you know, even though they're not getting into vampires and things like that, there is that that mystical um, thing, you know, with these strange creatures or actually zombies or, um, you know, uh, then then they get into like government conspiracies and things like that a little bit too so those are yeah because i do feel like some of these horror movies um, as far as the mood that sets definitely okay um also are you a fan of any modern monsters oh let's see well i always like count count but i guess he's not too modern and um i don't uh trying to think of any monster i would say i like there's nothing to, so you know here's something for uh you know going back a couple of questions about coming up with a horror movie i think it would be i don't have a monster i can relate to like i can with dracula or frankenstein from the 30s so i think there's a big void and a need for that so if you can come up with a character like that, then you're going to, you know, like that's going to take the uh, film industry by storm. And um, I mean, there's like I mentioned some of the, the uh, horror movies that I like, but I, I don't really have a uh, current favorite uh, from the 20th, 21st century. Okay. Uh, Samuel would like to know, uh, from a writing standpoint, do you think there is one archetypal monster that is the scariest? Um, I think vampires, and um, I, I would say that I think that, you know, Dracula is a cliche, so, uh, it, but if you go look at some of the other, uh, you know, vampire uh, movies that have been out, uh, they can be very frightening in, in more contemporary films, and I, so I think that 
I think that type of writing, um, I've, I've read Dracula, the Bram Stoker book a couple times. And that actually is a pretty, it's a very interesting book. It's a long book too, but it is very frightening. So, and it's old, it's like 150 years old or something like that. I think late 1800s, but um, it's, you know, no, it, it's, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. Shannon, it says Halloween three was not a Michael Myers film. What did you think of it? Um, I don't think anything. I, I don't think I saw that one. <laughs> okay. I got this solution with two. And uh, unless it, wait, I saw the one that came out, the last one that came out, and I don't remember which one that was. But it was just, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't like it that much. Mm hmm um bill asks did you see night of the living dead when you were growing up in vp i yeah i can't remember the first time i don't know if i was a little older in california i just remember it was i was watching it late i think it was after i uh after i grew up so i grew up in villa park and then um mm -hmm. i lived in california uh to go to grad school and work for uh, quite a uh, quite a number of years so I think it was during that time, it was late at night. And I just remember it was really a very creepy film. Very, everything about it felt like I was on edge the whole time I was watching it. So, so no, I didn't see it as a kid, but I did see it <laughs> as a young adult. Right. I actually have a question because I noticed that in your kind of your modern film montage, you included Twilight. Um, and I was wondering, I wanted to know what your thoughts were on how recently, like historically recently, we've seen a lot of the combination of romance and monster movies, things like The Shape of Water or Twilight, um, and what your thoughts are on that, on combining those two very specific genres. I think that's pretty intriguing because, uh, you know, you would never see that. 50 years ago in a movie and now they're showing a different side you know like vampires and werewolves maybe there's mm -hmm. sometimes they try to get along you know in, yeah. in twilight so um there there's uh, something you know really something to that and i think i think it's a significant twist and th one of the kinds of things where i was talking about where you can find a, a change of theme and it really it becomes it fresh. right it becomes very effective Excellent. All right. We have another, we have two comments. Uh, one says, I guess I would say something that would attract my attention in a horror movie is the silence, intense music, darkness, and monsters, because they make me feel more alert. Although I don't watch a lot of horror movies, but my brother does, especially the classic ones, uh, like the ones we saw today. So, kind of the atmospheric, um, setting of horror or the way the set dressing creates the tension. And we have one more comment. Oh, uh, Millais or a re Millais. It's great that Scorsese made Hugo. I agree. <laughs> That's a great film. You should, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Absolutely. Right. Does anyone have any other questions? By far the most questions um, I've gotten in a Q&A portion on a Zoom program uh, since we started in 2020. So congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, we got one more. What are your thoughts on, on the recent trend of horror movies tackling more tangible social issues um, like Jordan Peele's film Get Out rather than the tr traditional route of more surrealist themes? Well. I don't know. That's, that's an interesting question because I think, I think they're both good. I, I, uh, but I think maybe it's more relatable now, you know, with the kinds of films mm -hmm. you were just asking about. Um, Cause it really ties in more with what's going on there. Can dealing, you know, like when, you, in fact, when you're talking about romance and things like that, people relate to that. So it's not just watching a monster terrorize the countryside. So there's, there's a little bit more, I think you get more, you know, um, connection with the audience. Yeah, it brings the horror closer. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to 
Thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Um, this was a fantastic program. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, I'm looking at my notes because I'm terrible at these like intro outros. <laughs> um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. If you enjoyed this, uh, please consider joining us next week for another um, horror themed presentation from another um, COD faculty member. The presentation is Control the Chaos, Anxiety and Fear in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So it ties in very nicely to what we talked about uh, today. Registration is open. You register the same way you registered uh, for this program and there are still plenty of seats available. So if you're interested in doing this again with us next week, by all means, please do. Um, and again, thank you, Tony, so much for being here. It was a fantastic program and we had a great group um, and the great questions. Well, I'm really, I'm really honored to be asked to do this. This, this was great for me to prepare it and come and present tonight too. So thank you for inviting me. You're very, very welcome. And everyone have a very happy Halloween and enjoy the rest of your spooky season. You've got plenty of great recommendations and ideas to watch for your scary movie marathons. <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night. Good night, thank you so much.